Give me the child for seven years and I'll show you the man. Nutrition was being outsourced to somebody else. Vocation was being outsourced to somebody else. Health and wellness was being outsourced to somebody else. It's not right. Constant polarization. We're being pulled apart um, in societies by politicians. They want to squabble in amongst ourselves for their reasons, not for ours. Sometimes retribution is quite sweet. If we want to be successful, if we want to grow, if we want to be strong, it's got to start up here. And it starts with that empathy. There's, there's four billion people in the world. Two billion of them go to bed hungry every night. There's a billion of them go to bed every night just feeling unloved. When their money doesn't come in the door, you know, love goes out the window. Even if you're shouting at each other, it's still communication. When that stops, it's all over. Mental health is not what we're talking about here. Mental fitness is what we're talking about. Resilience, 80,000 industrial chemicals that are out there. Only five have ever been banned in the US. For certain reasons, certain stuff isn't taught. If you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. If you're at peace, you're living in the present. There's nothing that we can't do if you put our mind to it. The most expensive thing you can own at any time in your life is a closed mind. The age of enlightenment is upon us. Welcome to tonight's episode of The Health King's Court. I'm your host, Zach the Health King. A quick disclaimer to keep myself out of trouble. Anything that you hear in this podcast is not intended to be taken as medical advice. The thoughts and opinions you hear shared are just that, thoughts and opinions. And any action that you take based on what you hear is done at your own risk. And with that said, enjoy the show. Welcome everybody to today's episode of The Health King's Court, Ancient Wisdom, Modern Health. Today I have a really cool guest. He is based in Atlanta, Georgia serves the BBC, that's businesses, boomers, and coaches. He specializes in guiding key individuals in an organization or the whole team through changes, through fostering adaptability, and cultivating resilience. He has a long history of international sales and corporate experience. He's familiar with the stress-filled challenges of the business world, empowering his clients with the skills, tools, content, knowledge they need to overcome obstacles and to recognize the hidden beauty of difficult situations. He emphasizes the importance of handling toxic self-limiting beliefs in order to unlock personal and professional potential. If you or your team aim to enhance your performance, retention, or avoid burnout and stress, you're in for a treat with today's guest. It's my pleasure to introduce the corporate detox coach. That's Malcolm Evans. Malcolm, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Zach. It's great to be here. And uh, every time I listen to something like that, it uh, kind of thinks, wow, you know, where would all those years go? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, all been, it's, all time been flies. Time yeah. certainly flies. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing that I experience. It seems to accelerate as the years go by, does it? You got it. They say, well, was it... Uh, uh, you know, the youth is wasted on the young or something like that it was a quote <laughs> one long ago. Yeah. yeah. Never understood it. Now I do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a, oh man, it's a funny thing. I could, I could still think back to decades ago being a teenager and, and thinking how being almost 30 would seem like forever away. And now it's only a few years away. And so, wow. Anyway. Yeah. Without, you know, belaboring this point too much, you know, uh, years ago when I was in high school, I remember sitting in a math class and I I, I, I didn't do all that well in math, you know, it's uh, just strange because I went into electrical power and, you know, um, three, three of us, my friend and uh, two of my friends and myself sitting and talking and saying, wow, in the year 2000, we'll be like 40 something. That is incredible. Well, where did that, that blew through, you know, with the Y2K, you know, the every computer is going to collapse and wherever. And uh, yeah, it didn't. Anyway, sorry, I just uh, unload that from my mind and blew it a bit. No, no worries. No worries. So we got plenty to talk about. You know, we've had some chats already. Uh, you were a very diverse individual with a lot of areas of interest. But as we discussed, we have a couple of things that we wanted to cover. And all of them have to do with wellness, whether that's mental, physical, in relation to relations. Um, 
So something we could begin with that you've mentioned is talking about toxicity. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that there's a certain cycle that toxicity goes through. Do you want to expand on what that is or, or what you mean by that? Yeah, sure. And and I've got to say, that, you know, look, I've had like seven, eight different careers, disparate ones that I can draw a ring around. And I've been pretty good at all of them. One thing I'd, that I've never been is a doctor. OK, so anything I, I, I'm not giving medical advice. This is stuff that uh, um, I've adapted and learned over the years. And uh, um, I used to belong to a service organization whose motto was adapt, adopt, and uh, oh, sorry, uh, adopt, adapt, and improve. And when I left the corporate world for the third and final time in 2013 um, to start a, a coaching practice, which was in business development and working with uh, executives on you know, project pursuit and so on, I knew in my heart of hearts that to be successful. I needed to show up vibrant. I needed to show up energetic. And I needed to show up with stamina to be able to keep doing it. And uh, anyone in a small business or growing a small business knows that there are, you know, there are diverse things that you need to to have the skills at. So I wasn't worried about the skills part, but it was it was the stress that was starting to come. So this is a, an area that I got very sort of tried to get knowledgeable about, but also what I was putting in my mind was affecting my body. So I needed to understand how my body was holding up to this. So this is where I got into the whole thing of detox. And uh, I, I, I have a very simplistic view on the world. Um, how can the good stuff get in if the bad stuff is inhibiting it? So equally in, in thoughts uh, and performance, then in body, and then this was all manifesting in, in results and relationship. Yeah, certainly. There's no doubt that input equals output. Mm -hmm. And input doesn't necessarily come right out, though. It sometimes builds up and can stick around, and especially that negative stuff, yeah. whether it is the physical side of things or the mental side of things. The real negative things that get built up, they, they get real sticky and they can be real hard to get rid of and replace with good stuff. Mm. Um, and so you said how what you put into the mind affects the body. Yeah. Does it go the other way as well? Um, absolutely. And, you know, um, I, I don't think of this as too original. You know, I use a triangle. I call it the, uh, the toxic triangle. And if you imagine at the base of the triangle, there are relationships. On the one side, there, there are um, bodily wellness, and on the other side, there are you know, mindful wellness, you know, mental fitness. And um, an equal-sided triangle is probably one of the, the strongest shapes that, that we know of. Now, if you imagine one of those sides being a little bit weaker than the others, it's going to put strain on itself because the others are, you know, nothing's balanced anymore there there's, there's a, a chink in the armor so with that simple philosophy um i really felt that uh, um i needed to learn how to balance these things and certainly over the years i've seen i've seen things that uh, my my individual wellness I, I used to be an athlete when i was younger an endurance athlete and full contact sports and things like that i can say now um, later in life, I'm in as good physical condition as I was then. I don't run ultra marathons anymore, but hey, there's still one in you know, mentally in me. Then I come into the, you know, the 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 mental fitness side of it, and I would boil that down to resilience. And resilience that uh, over the years I, I've lived in a you know, multitude of countries. Um, I've had lots of different jobs. Uh, I've been through many, many stressful situations, and I've always seemed to come out of it and having a, uh, and almost a, an inherent safe pair of hands approach. Look, you know, if I panic, things are going to get worse. They'll go out of control. Stay composed. 
manage things in front of me, not imagine what could be happening, just just uh, just respond to what's occurring. And then, you know, the, the pressures of, uh, of marriage, children, relationships, you know, growing a young family, trying to balance work and, and these things. And uh, often I talk to people about the, the, the work-life balance, you know, having a gray zone, not bringing work into the house directly and not taking you know, any sort of family concerns or troubles at home to work. No, th these things are difficult. So this is where the, the gray zone sort of uh, um, recommendation would come. And you know, I only recommend stuff that I've uh, I've done for myself. Yeah, absolutely. So you're speaking from experience and, and someone that's conscious of what's going on in their life and then conscious of what they're getting out of life is going to develop over time some ideas of what works and what doesn't. And so we're bouncing around a little bit between mind, body, work, home. Let, let's, let's, let's dig deep. Let's okay. dig deep. Let's, yeah. uh, let's, let's start around. with the triangle, right? Yeah. The first one that you mentioned in the triangle is the mind. So people's mental health. Yeah. And that's a total rabbit hole that we could get into. But let's start with what do you think is going on in the average person's mind is the average person healthy in the mind are they not and why or why not do you think yeah. all right well um if we go back long ago far away aristotle i think it was uh, said that um give me the child for seven years and i'll show you the man the jesuit priests re regurgitated this you know in the you know, like 15th 16th century or wherever and what what I believe that they were talking about is that um, as we everybody's let's assume everybody's born with very very similar um, skills to cope um, in the environment that's around them, but they adapt to what's happening, and so um, very much akin to like having a deck of cards. Okay, take one suit out of there. You've got you know. Um, You've got 12 cards in there, I think, and we're all dealt the same hand. It's just how we play them back is responsive to what's going on around us. And what I mean here is that uh, two children could grow up in the same town, go to the same school, but have different influences both at home and in the schoolyard, which they adapt to for their emotional and sometimes for their physical safety and you know being able to to thrive and um you know myself i i know you know i moved around a lot as a kid my family business we were in pubs and beer and restaurants and things and we moved from place to place i had to fit in um at different schools um for over a, a period of two or three years changed schools a lot because our businesses were moving and um i looking back i can i can see some of the things that uh, um affected me now where i'm going with this is that uh, uh, to, to answer your question there's uh, many variables we have some constants we will assume everybody is, is born with the same um, hand um, if you think of where they live in the world and you think of what those early experiences have been to prepare them for later in life when things can get even more stressy than what they are uh, being young. Now, over this last few years, if we just look at, say, the USA, and by my accent, you have probably deduced by now uh -huh. that I'm not originally from the US. I'm from the South, yeah, that's where I am now in Atlanta, but I originated in a different South in the UK. Now, coming here, um, I saw, um, um, the reason I came here was to, was to promote globalization and, you know, uh, within my own company so we could interact better with our sister companies around the world. And what I saw early on is um, there were a lot of things here that were different than where I came from. Convenience was very much a thing here. And that goes back into lifestyles, goes in and then, then we can connect to those lifestyles and you know, careers and so on, with how the both parents needed to be at work 
in order to maintain a certain lifestyle or whatever for the family, the one that they wanted. So, and again, I did, it's a big subject. I don't mean to jump around, but, but what I, what I saw was a lot of things were outsourced. Well, you know, um, because both parents were working, you know, fast food was a thing, convenience meals, things that came out of the aisle in the supermarket, which we you know, all appreciate now are not as good for you as, as home prepared stuff with fresh ingredients. Then we had um, the, the, the work environment. The work environment is pretty much everybody at a job, even though know, there, are, there are a lot of uh, uh, small businesses, self-employed people, the majority work for other people, either in a factory or in, a, in an office. And with the expansion and contraction of economies, well, a lot of people lost their jobs, especially in 2008, 2012, and over this last years in the in the 20s. Then we bring this in, into health and wellness. Well, the philosophy, you know, because of the amount of marketing and because the amount of um, sort of cultural approaches to, to health and wellness here, if there's something not right, there's a pill for that. There's a drug for that. Let me go to the doctor. And again, somebody is outsourcing their um, health and wellness. If it's not right, doctor will give me a pill and then I'll mask it and make it better. So what I saw was um, first, you know, nutrition was being outsourced to somebody else. Vocation was being outsourced to somebody else. Health and wellness was being outsourced to somebody else. And then you add on all of the pressures of things like the, the need and necessity to have a college degree. So how many people are, are carrying an awful lot of uh, um, student loans around them? Non-forgivable loans. That is a stress that, that, that follows anyone into their 40s. 50s even. I, I know people that are in their 60s are still trying to pay college debt off. So all of these things add up to different times than, than parents and earlier generations have been through. Maybe the baby boomers didn't have it so so tough, tough or the tail end of them they did. You know, that, that's a little bit subjective. But so where you grow up and the timing that you grow up. Now, and I define all of this is, is down in to be able to, to cope and navigate with a clear mind and conviction, the building blocks of what I, what I would say is resilience. And resilience, these are learned habits that come from previous experiences, whether it's been in the schoolyard, whether it's been stuff that's been you know um, built and learned from competitive sports or in the career so again so as a big answer <laughs> but uh it, that that one word resilience and the fear of the unknown yeah yeah there's a lot that we could a lot that we could unpack there a couple of points that i'll avoid digging into because i know you don't want to get too political but um let's take it back to even the beginning right because you said you touched upon the kind of the nature versus the nurture debate mm. Do you think everyone is born with the same basis point, the same deck of cards? Let's say even two people, same location, same place they're born, same social class, same family even at the same time. Do you think inherently everyone is playing with the same card to begin with? Or are those, is there a baseline kind of difference to begin with in um, levels of intelligence, levels of resilience, levels of individuality um i think you know these things are you know the uh, a lot of it can be genetic handed down you know um, malcolm gladwell has a, a good book i think it's called outliers yeah it's subjective whether it's a good book or not it's a book i read it and it, it, it's memorable or whatever and he talks there about the canadian uh, hockey league how an awful lot of the players predominantly are all born in like august or september so what has happened there is that um, if you imagine in a grade in, in school, um, the ones born earlier in the, in the school year, um, especially, you know, uh, um, young males in, you know, 
moving into adolescence or wherever, they have growth spurts. Well, depends where you are in in that sort of being born in that year. Your growth spurt might be, you know, faster or quicker. You may be bigger than other kids in in your um, that you're competing with for positions on sports teams. And what he said is those because those guys were born earlier in the school year, they had a physical advantage. And I saw this up, up in a different way in 2008 when my son graduated from college, where the economies were, were, were shaken and companies, you know, they had a choice to make. What do they do? Do they take on a new graduate who may be with them for a couple of years, learn stuff and want to move on? Or do they take somebody that is older, has responsibilities, you know, he's got a mortgage, got kids in school, and you know, it's, he's, he's got these pressures on him. Is he going to stay longer, and can they work him harder? So, you know, yes, um, everybody starts off, I believe, in the same way. Okay, there are influences, obviously, genetics and stuff, physical things, or wherever they're going to set us apart, but also how the influences of growing up in what's around them starts to shape them. Um, the family they grow up, are the, are the parents, these helicopter parents, overbearing, you know, living, trying to live vicariously through the children because they feel they missed something, you know, out of their own sort of, um, you know, growing up, whether it's in, you know, whether it's ego or esteem, whether it's just, just absolute love. They want their kids to do well. They want them to be that next tennis superstar or that hockey player. So the parents may be pushing them and the kids are just, well, hey, I need to adapt according to this. And they may develop certain character traits where they are, you know, more competitive than they may have been if they hadn't had the influences and pushing and pressure from the parents. Interesting. And so yourself, you seem like a very intelligent, clearly very well-spoken and successful man. What were some of those factors that influenced you to become who you are today? What, what do you think were some of those environmental things growing up at that pivotal time that shaped you either in a positive way and gave you those advantages or perhaps presented you challenges that you had to overcome, if you'd like to share? Yeah, well, of, of course, you know, and um, we're equally cursed and blessed. We're going to get the good. We're going to get the bad as we grow. And, you know, my my parents. Um, I was born, you know, um, um, very close to the start of the '60s, and you know, both my parents worked um, their jobs. I was I was what was called a latchkey kid. I came home, there was a key hanging on a piece of string. You know, we <laughs> hand through the 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 mailbox. We had a we didn't have a box outside in the UK. We you know, the mail was delivered through the front door, and there was a key hanging there. So I'd come home from school and, and the school was only, you know, maybe a quarter of a mile away up the lane or wherever. So there you know, wasn't too much uh, of an issue. And maybe in, you know, a, an hour or so, I had to wait for my, my sister to come home. Well, or, you know, I should have stayed in the house, but the kids around, hey, we're all out playing. We're all in the same situation. We, you know, maybe go running off or wherever. Um, that gave me a, a, a bit of, you know, resilience and, you know, I could spread my wings or wherever. And as I grew and we, um, we you know, move into me being nine, 10 years of age, we, we start to move from, you know, the town I was born in into other places. And I'm talking like 30 miles away. But I'm talking culture shifts. People speak in English, but not in the same way as I, I knew English, heavy accents, different social demographics, maybe more industrial towns. Now, school was, you know, had to fit in. Um, at that age, I would, I was starting to get, you know, put a bit of weight on. And um, I became, you know, that new target that had just joined school. I was the butt of a lot of jokes. I got my, excuse my French, I got my ass kicked a lot. But it only lasted for a period, you know, maybe a, a couple of years where we moved from different schools. And uh, my outlet was sport. Um, I, I, I played judo and or, or did judo. I played rugby and soccer and tennis, anything that I could compete with. And through that, I got, I got recognition. I got acceptance. 
And as I had my growth spurt, I was physically um, larger than than others around me. So some of this intimidation tended to, you know, um, burn itself out. But but still, I bore the um, I had a very short fuse, but also had the ability to almost like go along to get along. I could fit in. I was very learning some very good social skills at that time. And um, these I took into my sort of late teens and early 20s. You know, I was the life and soul of the party. I was probably the first one there and the last one to go home. And, you know, that was almost like I was uh, um, searching for acceptance. I'd, I'd learned how to fit in if I did certain things. I like that. I like that because it's very exemplary of my philosophy on what makes a man a man or what makes a young man into a, a full grown man. Those ass kickings sound like they were exactly what you needed. It sounds like they encourage you to rise to the occasion because you didn't want to get those ass kickings anymore. You wanted to prove yourself. So you got yourself up, got yourself together, developed skills that got you the recognition and earned your way into respect. Would you say that's accurate? Absolutely. And, and, and learning from, you know, situational things or whatever. And of course, then, you know, as you, you grow older and maybe you get your, your collar pulled by a policeman or whatever, and you, 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 what we would call it in Britain, the short, sharp shock. <laughs> you do not want to take that news home to your parents because, you know, the uh, I'm not saying the ass kicking would continue there, but certainly you'd be grounded for a while or wherever. Um, so, you know, learning these habits of, uh, of, of socializing, you know, being able to fit in or wherever. Um, and but my home life was yeah, it was great. My parents were very supportive of everything. Try this, go do that. I tried every blooming sport, joined every club or whatever, till I found what worked for me. And as I said, that that outlet, that what f worked for me was 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 sport. You know, I was a I was a, a competitive. I was pretty good in school, but didn't have the interest really. You know, I was getting more stimulation out. You know, from you know, competing and being being recognized for being on like the, the the school team, the the regional team, you know, the 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 state team, and so on, and those things. But um, you know, um, some of the you know the habits that I picked up of you know the socialization stuff and later on you get in, in life, you know, experiment with the. Uh, uh, with alcohol, never anything else or anything like that. But, you know, I can, we get presented with um, forks in the road where we need to make a decision. So, you know, some of the stuff that we've learned earlier in life influence us when we meet those forks in the road. So, you know, in retrospect, looking back, I now can see why I took the the road to the left as opposed to the road to the, the right, which may have been better, was you know, uh, because of my earlier experiences and just you, you learn habits, you learn how to think and react, you know, situationally. But the good news is this stuff can be unlearned. You know, you know, old dogs can learn new tricks. We've, we've got a, uh, we're blessed with just a, you know, a, a fantastic being that we are, you know, um, I would say we don't buy it, we rent it. You know, we've had it for so many years. And um, but one thing we've got is is our ability to adapt to the things around us. And you know, you know, our, our, our if we do things long enough, our the our brains pick that up and learn. You know, there's patterns, neuroplasty kicks in, and, and so on. I don't want to get too technical or whatever. But yes, you know, we can learn. We can learn habits and a lot of. Those behaviors are learned and influenced, you know, uh, a result of the influences that we have as we're growing. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I don't think anything is a terminal sentence. I think with the right tools and with the right attitude and with the right dedication, we can absolutely turn around our own lives, whether it's uninstalling mental programming that's been put on us from our parents or from the educational system or from media or from just 
happening experientially. Uh, I think anyone can change their life around from whatever they are currently at, if it's unsavory to them. Just one more question on, on this side of things, and we'll move on to another topic. Uh, mm -hmm. So you mentioned how things were when you grew up, and that's a different time than when I grew up, and that's a different time than what people that are growing up now are facing. Yeah. Do you think it's become more difficult or more easy or easier for someone growing up in these times to grow up with a healthy mind? Mm -hmm. And this is this is a great question, and um, and I have to say is just before you ask it, I was actually thinking of the same thing. And what my brother-in-law used to say to me about as I was growing, he said, "Oh, the years before me, we'd be out. You, we'd be, we wouldn't be sat here watching television or whatever." I think these are very different times, and the, you know, there's been a lot of benefit to technology. You know, it's made you know us live in a lot. Uh, easier we become a lot a bit bit softer i think along the way but it comes at a cost and the ease and convenience of um anyone giving you know a, a message and constantly reinforcing it whether it's good or bad you know that is is a downside to it there's no switch off now i can remember when i was in school and you know i'd think well the next day oh that kid is there and i bet he's going to come in blooming you know, have a go at me uh, again, you know, tomorrow or today or wherever, you know, but it was finished when I got home. I was with my my friends and wherever. Now things can be continued through social media. They can, you know, quite easily be, you know, bullying is, is, a, is, is a much easier thing for a bully to do these days. <laughs> OK, um, but I would tell anyone that is being bullied. OK, look, the the worm will turn. You learn a way you and you 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 confront these folks if you uh, if you feel safe about it. And um, and, you know, I don't know whether you'll keep this bit in, but sometimes retribution is quite sweet. OK, you know, oh, I'll definitely keep that in because <laughs> I agree. And that brings up a lot of other conversational points, but, you know, I, I can relate. I, growing up, I was a very quiet, quiet young man or young boy in elementary school and grade school, et cetera. And I got picked on and yeah. I decided eventually I wanted to make a change. And long story short, I could give examples of being a freshman in high school, even, and some senior jackass talking smack, talking smack, talking smack. Uh, it's fine. You could say whatever you want. It rolls off my back. Well, one time I was walking past him and he put his hands on me, pushed me from behind. Well, that crossed the line, turned around, started rocking him. He cowered in fear because that's what he was, a coward. And yeah. he was always very nice to me after that. But I'm even back then, that wasn't that long ago, but that's a very different thing than today. Because two... This, it's hard. It's hard, especially in a public education system, but really in society overall. Bullies seem to be getting away with things and be able to do whatever they want. And mm -hmm. then when someone stands up for themselves, well, then that kid gets in trouble. How common is that story these days? If, oh, this kid gets picked on, picked on, picked on, picked on. And finally, he, bam, makes a retribution. Now, instead of a quiet, real quick jive from the bully... Or, or, you know, even if it's a very impactful thing or if even if it's a physical thing, well, now it's it's noisier because now the person's actually fighting back. Now it's an actual confrontation. And now it gets dealt with by the administration. And then the one person seems like the aggressor. And, and so it's like, where do you whereas even a couple of years ago, you could get away with that or, you know, again, I don't want to go too deep into politics if you don't want to. But no, within the educational system itself, yeah. it, it's it's like you're damned if you do damned if you don't uh and it seems to be a a conundrum that people are, are caught in and well i i come from old school okay <laughs> um if, if if i went home and i i told my dad that um hey you know policeman told me off clip my ear told me give you this message he'd do the same because in those days the police were respected yeah, that's how everyone grew up. Otherwise, it would be, be anarchy without them, you know. Um, what I I think is that 
And this comes down a lot to, you know, this whole thing of politics. Different households have different politics and, you know, um, and, and, and like religion or whatever, children tend to follow because they are almost indoctrinated to do this. You are going to go to church. There's going to be a, a time in your life you're allowed to make a decision for yourself. Equally, you know, bullying is, a, is, is something that continues unless there's a backlash like you've just you know, explained there. And it stops quickly then, or at least it should do. <laughs> but to, to instill into, a, 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 um, uh, I believe, a, a child that, that if somebody has physically assaulted you and you, you did turn the other cheek and you didn't write back, you know, resist or retaliate or anything, there's, there's going to be an emotional cost to it. There's going to be a damage to the ego. And, you know, anybody that has ever been in an altercation, whether they've, they've wrestled in school or whether they've played soccer and they've had that, you know, sort of somebody's chopped their their feet out and taking the ball or whatever. There's been that moment of rage. And these are these are fight or flight reactions that we have. We are being physically threatened. Adrenaline rushes all around our body for away from our organs into our our muscles and our limbs or whatever, ready for us to react. So whether it's a tiger or whether it's a bully, we're ready to go. And and in that moment, you know, this enormous amount of stress is created on the body. Now, what is this happening in modern times is, and what is also happening because we're not allowed to fight back against those bullies, those stresses, those things like cortisol and, and whatever, are building up in the body and doing long-term damage because it, the valve is not being switched off. And whether it's coming at us through the, you know, the social media or the TV, or whether it's that constant bullying, whether it's you know, Twitter feeds or whatever it is, and the constant polarization that we're we're being pulled apart um, in societies by politicians. They want to squabble in amongst ourselves for their reasons, not for ours. They're there yeah. to represent us, but anyway, and we could go off. But but you know, you you are absolutely right. All of these things are inexorably connected. And for for youngsters, you know, coming through these times, parents really, really have to, you know, think of the long term impact of how they nurture their, you know. The ones that they borrow in, I, I say, <laughs> children. We don't, we don't buy them. We borrow them. They, they, eighteen. They've gone off to college, or they've gone somewhere, and uh, you know, you might not see them for a while. Um, so, you know, the, the the parenting style is is really, you know, me having three boys. I tell them, look, hey, you you follow the rules, but if somebody puts the, you know, oversteps, uh, puts you at a threat, you resist. You know, you don't you don't just accept it or whatever because it will perpetuate. Yeah. Disrespect yeah. needs to be quelled and dealt with because if we don't, then we are disrespecting ourselves. And when we disrespect ourselves, it's it's massively traumatic because the only way to cope with it is to the mental pattern to be formed that I am not worth defending. Just I am not worth it. sticking up for. I cannot do anything. And then this learned helplessness comes on where someone just gets mentally beat into submission and they just become almost not human anymore because they don't even have a self identity that they care about. And then that extrapolates on to impact their everyday existence and everything they do for the rest of their life, because then they'll never advocate for themselves against anything, whether that is some sort of crazy policy, whether that is some sort of confrontation with criminal, with the law, with whatever, with their boss, you know, it, it creates a, just a, a, a drone really of someone kind of going through the motions of life because they don't even care to stick up for themselves. It's a, it's a huge, it's a huge impact that yeah, we just touched upon. I'm and you you you're nailing it there and um you know 
later in life, as I, you know, I've moved around, been in different countries and so on, and uh, I can say that moving to this country was like it was a fantastic experience. Okay, we we're now citizens. We stay here. I always wanted uh, experiences for my 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 boys, just my my wife, myself, and whatever. So we get variety, but they get exposure to new things and new people and different cultures and so on. Um, but I found that the um, you know working under a, a visa and obviously having a home and everything like that and income and disruption of because uh, I I I felt the effect of some of the disruption in my. Um, education, where we'd moved around a little bit, I lost continuity of you know coursework and, and things like this, and it was it was hard to catch up. Um, where I'm going with this is um, having a work visa and then having constant pressure at work. I was becoming, as I would describe it, um, almost like a passive aggressive. I was internalizing things, and I was bringing some of this stuff home. I was arguing, and that wasn't good at the home life. And guess what? You you, something's not right, you don't sleep well, you go back to work tired the next day and you, you're a little bit on edge and whatever, wonder what's coming, constant pressure, go back home or you know, the argument, have another drink or whatever, blah, blah. And these these things start to you know create the, the toxic triangle, the cycle of, 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 of persistent sort of stress. Now, you know, someone sent me a, a book at, at one time and it was called uh, don't sweat the small stuff and it was all small stuff and i eh, okay i did it the respect that you know somebody cared enough to send it to me and this was a colleague and i got half the way through it and i each page that i'd been skipping i was thinking i know this and this is i got to a certain point is yeah i know all this and i used to do it I'm not doing it now. And I put the book down, and from there, going forward, my demeanor changed. You know, longer was I going to be allowed to be bullied at work. And this is, you know, dealing with, with grown-ups, but, you know, the politics that exist in corporations. And I had a pretty senior role, but, you know, I had uh, others, uh, different axes to grind and wherever, and uh, were putting pressures on. All of this passed, all of this passed, and I began to thrive, and I became a, um, uh, got my green card, got my citizenship and everything, and it was, yeah, like, hey, I, what's the worst thing that can happen? <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they let me go, I'll go and get another job somewhere else. Uh, but, but then that, that, almost like that veil of insecurity lifted, once you shift that mindset, what's the worst thing can happen? And you're mentally attuned and prepared and, you know, you can go any direction with that. And that was the resilience coming back. Yeah, that's huge. Everything in life is figure outable. You can figure it out, whether mm -hmm. it, this happened, that happened, whatever. As long as you don't haven't broken rule number one, which is don't die, then yeah. you can move forward in some sort of way. That's you a know? big don't die. You know? Yeah, yeah, definitely words to live by. Yeah. <laughs> um, but one one thing that I I, I, I want to just uh, have another bite at that is yeah. is the individual should not unlove themselves. Think anything less of themselves. It's not them. We all have to uh, um, adapt to our surroundings at some time in life. Giving ourselves empathy, giving ourselves the the love that we deserve, nurturing ourselves treating ourselves first it is not selfish it's selfish for somebody else's perspective that insists you must look after them first and i learned some of these things later in life i was always this pleaser i was this uh you know, wanted to help and uh and you know out of all the fights i got in you know as a teenager you know growing up or whatever i'd say 50 percent of them were in defense of somebody else did that do them any good? No, maybe, you know, I should have let my friends, you know, get their ass kicked a little bit. They may have, uh, you know, grown a little bit stronger. But I was prepared to step in because you know, I felt that was the thing to do, to be the protector. Maybe that was part of me going, you know, you know fitting in and going along to get along or whatever. Yeah. And in that, I don't think I loved myself as much. 
you know, growing up in a small village, you don't brag, you don't do these things, you just take it, otherwise it's going to attract attention. But later in life, we're going to learn if we want to be successful, if we want to grow, if we want to be strong, it's got to start up here. And it starts with that empathy. It starts with the I am. You can see it. It's hanging on the wall behind me. Wherever we are, I am. You know, and I am calm because I've got that resilience. Sorry. Is it sometimes then, though? Is it sometimes I am a jackass and I need to make massive changes. Absolutely. But there is such a thing is, you know, we've got these sort of angels, we've got these wolves, we've got the two, two, you know, we've got the, the, the eternal voices in our head, which are judging us. Okay. Uh, and I follow a very regimented specific program and I teach this and so on. And I don't, I don't want it to be an advert or whatever, but going into this, we, we learn that there's, you know, we, we, we're getting so many thoughts in our day. And if we allow the negative ones, the ones that are based in fear, recrimination, anxiety, or the, or the, the what might happen is all, you know, the world's going to fall in or wherever. They become negative and we, you know, our actions come from that. Instead of spotting them and looking for things like opportunities and, and gifts anywhere in there. Now, my... You know, when I tuned into this, and I've always been pretty optimistic as a person, but once I started to shift and write, you know, if if something really aggravates me, my hot button gets pressed or wherever in traffic, or it was, you know, I was threatened or wherever, I feel it in my chest instantly. And this has always amazed me. How can something go from an, an external sort of image, source, visualization, smell or wherever, immediately into a reaction, which creates anxiety or fear or stress or something in you know as a physical thing in my body but as soon as i notice that then the in inquiry starts and what if it's me that i'm thinking I'm, I'm i'm stupid i shouldn't have done that i know i know no better it's a choice of the voice that i listen to it could be a harmful one or it could be one that's nurturing and saying hey come on malcolm you, you you've done this before you've got this don't worry about that just remember before all right this is what you learned. You can do this. And even this experience will, you know, you'll be replaying this in the future and you will handle this current situation or the future situation easier because we we have that mental muscle that's been built up. And that's just, just one of the things. Certainly. And the language that we use to describe events or even internal thought processes is very important. But the reason I ask that is because I think that amongst this, especially new era where everyone is working on themselves and, and trying to live healthier, happier, a lot of it has been externalized. And I think there's been a over exaggeration or overcorrection or just a an excusing of oneself mm -hmm. in the realm of accept me how I am and oh these people are judging me they're not loving me for how I am all oh, my family doesn't accept me for how I am well maybe you're an alcoholic that's mean to everybody and everyone hates you because you're a disgusting person temporarily and right now you know what I'm saying so that's what I'm trying to dig into and trying to combat because we could get into all sorts of unhealthy behaviors that these days people have kind of excused in the realm of, oh, it's not me. It's my environment. It's it's the world around me that has a problem with me. Well, no, maybe you genuinely do need to self-reflect and say, I have been being awful. Maybe I am not awful to my core, but maybe I have been being. And only then can someone truly make the changes that matter in a positive direction. You see what I'm getting at? I, I do. And, you know, I'm, one thing I would, uh, you know, you don't have to answer this specifically, but just, you know, sort of a, just a general relation to it. If you have a hard day, you may want to grab a beer, take the edge off, a glass mm -hmm. of wine or something like that. Or maybe there are people that have a hard day and go there and then it gets numbed. Whatever they're dealing with gets numbed. It's a temporary sort of sticking plaster. They wake up with a hangover. The problem is still there in the morning. 
Okay, it's not going away. It's a temporary patch. So, you know, maybe this comes down to resilience, getting back to resilience, that the coping skills that somebody, you know, is is internalizing and immediately thinking, woe is me, instead of, hey, I've been here before. I got this. Or in order to be able to, to you know, get through this current situation, I need to learn more information or I need to gather more information. I need, maybe need I need some more coping skills. Yeah. I, yeah. Alcohol is certainly an interesting topic. I think it does more harm than good in the world. I don't think it itself is evil, but I think people do damage themselves more with it than good comes of it. But that's a whole other thing. I grew that's, up in a pub. I've seen yeah. these from an early age, you know, how adults were behaving. But it, the same could be said of, um, you know, taking the edge off, you know, with you hear people going to buy, you know, shopping all the time. No. You know, the, 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 the short term application or whatever um, of, of that problem, you know, what do they end up in the morning with? A, a nice purse. And a, and a larger credit card bill, which creates even more stress. So the yeah. problem just doesn't go away then. Yeah, and, we, we could dive into the mind of an individual for forever. But yeah. let's uh, let's branch off to the other side, another side of the triangle. Let's talk about relations. And yeah. when you talk about relations, are you talking about like romantic and familial, or are you talking about societal and, and relations with everyone around you in your day to day basis? All of the above. You know, there's a, there's a micro and the macro approach to this. And in if you imagine somebody in their you know, micro environment, and I, I I speak to this, and especially to you know managers and employers, you know nurture the um, the most important asset they've got. And you know, in business school, I learned many years ago, we've got three assets in business: men, money, and machines. And these are the same things that we manage at home as well. We manage ourselves and and the resources that we got. Now, if we uh, accept that the um, uh, the men, the women, are the you know the the managers of the machines and the money, and to get the best out of them, we need to you know we need to nurture you know that important resource. Now, if um, there's a three sixty degree approach to this, I've always believed somebody comes to work, they have a they're under pressure, and for, for the most part, people are disengaged at work. They've got other stuff on their mind. They're you know, busy talking, or they're at the water cooler, or getting coffee, or whatever. Distractions, maybe they're not as productive as they could be. But if they've got something on their mind, something that's worrying them, or whatever, they're even, even more inclined to be uh, distracted. Okay, work is not going so well. It's stressy. They go home. As I mentioned, they don't have any gray zone. They, they walk straight into the house. The kids are coming after them. Wife is saying, yeah, you haven't, pay, you haven't paid the plumbing mortgage. This It's a day late. The bank's calling me. That explodes. However that, uh, um, that individual would react, maybe reaching for that you know, bottle of beer again or just walking out or... I'm going to go watch TV or just ignoring it. And all of this is welling up through the evening. You know, more stress. Well, that affects sleep. People wake up, they're tired, they go back to work, fight their way through the traffic, go into work. It all starts again. And what I say to um, to managers and em em employees is um, help nurture those situations. Have some time to talk to your employees about how they're doing. What's going on? Because relationships at, at home can manifest at work, and it doesn't take much. If somebody is tired, they're edgy, they're under pressure, they're feeling you know, undervalued or whatever. And someone told me this many, many years ago, and at this time, the numbers they used, they said, look, there's, you know, um, there's, there's 4 billion people in the world. 2 billion of them are, are go to bed hungry every night. But there's a billion of them go to go to bed every night just feeling unloved. You know, what can we cure? What are the easier things that we can we can manage? So those those individuals in their their relationships and especially the way things are at uh, in society and you know in particular at work, all it needs is the wrong word said in the wrong way or the right word says in the wrong said in the wrong way to be misconstrued. Human resources are called, or wherever they are, you know, you know, 
the HR department or whatever, and it can escalate very quickly and create all sorts of problems. People get just get fired and let go, and that compounds what's going on in the other relationships in their life. So that's where I believe that it comes to the uh, understanding the the individual, what they are getting out of life, you know. And and yeah, you know, I bet you know people that uh, that say, "As I am fed up with my job," you know. I just yeah, I, I wish I could go do something else. And this, but they're still they go in, they're spending you know eight ten hours a day fighting their way to work and then being in work, whereas they you know. They would maybe want to be somewhere else, being a carpenter or an artist or a poet or a piano player or something. Yeah. Yeah, I try not to hang around those people. They're usually not happy to be around. But <laughs> you mentioned relationships at home. What do you think is the state of the average relationship at home and why? Um, I, I think it's it's under stress. Um, and it, it it's under stress for many different things, many different reasons. You know, we go back to the old basics. You know, it's it's, it's money. You know, somebody told me you know one time when uh, money doesn't come in the door, you know, love goes out the window. Absolutely true, and it takes a very strong relationship to be able to um, to navigate some of these stresses, some of these worries. You know, um, I always I always joke that. Um, uh, I, I married my high school sweetheart. We 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 left, you know, the UK. You know, we were we weren't twenty four, and um, we went to a place where we didn't have a relative on the continent. Running home to mum wasn't uh, uh, an option, so we worked through it. And here we are, forty odd years later. We still have our moments, but we work our way through it. And a big part of it is communication. And, you know, this this would go back to the, the workplace as well. Um, agreements over intentions, expecting somebody to behave in, in the way that you want them instead of, you know, talking it through. And one very valuable um, tool, I say, for anybody that is going through any kind of relationship thing is to, is to sit and talk. And to repeat back what, they, you know, look, something isn't quite right. You know, I, I want you to tell me what it is. And when the other person has said it, the manager or the significant other, is it's to say, look, okay, I'm going to try and repeat this back in 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 the the way as as accurate as I can to what I heard, and see how far off track they are, and then go through that, and then it's the other person's turn then. And um, you know, um, my my wife had said over the years, you know, uh, I don't listen. And when we're presented with with with, with a, an issue, hey, we're going to buy a house, we're going to buy a bit of ground, we're going to do this, we're going to go on a vacation or whatever. Well, my wife might say, nah, that doesn't feel good. I would say, no, no, you're just worried about it and whatever. Let me get a spreadsheet out. I'll prove to you that it's sound or whatever. And she said, you may be able to do that, but you're not hearing me. And it took me a long time to actually appreciate that. But once I did, and I started listening, because I'm, you know, I'm. I'll get stuff done, you know. I'll. I'm. I'm a bull in a china shop. I'll go ahead. And she's a little bit more sort of strategic and complementative, mm -hmm. a bit more, you know, uh, a softer pitch and pace and wherever. We're and you know we, we've held it together all over the years. So there must be something that uh, um, that works there. And I would say it in later in life, it's come down to the communication. I know anyone that's listening has ever been a you know a, an empty nester, you know the question all of my empty nester friends ask of their their significant other, okay, kids are gone. What now? <laughs> Why did we get married? <laughs> Do we still love each other? And if the answer is yes, they'll make it work. If there's any doubt, then they need to talk about it there, because that whole you know divorce stuff. Dang, if you want to think about something's expensive and you want to finance it. Get one of those. Yeah, they stay with you for a long time, and and it's never. It's tragic to see a you know a, a marriage breakdown. You know that's a, that hurts me. Yeah, um, communication certainly is key, and those conversations seem like a simple and obvious thing. But I think most people aren't equipped with the capacity or knowledge of how to even have 
those simple conversations of, hey, what are you looking to get out of this relationship? What am I looking to get out of this relationship? Do they align? Are they the same thing? How can we be on the same page? Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier said than done, especially because people aren't taught how to have those conversations. In fact, they're usually taught the opposite and the contrary through media and the television shows and the examples of relationships that are shown there through most likely their own parents who may have unhealthy relationship patterns that they've absorbed. People are not equipped necessarily by what's going on around them to at all be able to have those communication modalities. And then when they experience it, say they enter a, an arrangement with a partner that does know how to do those things, it feels so foreign to them that they can often even get suspicious of it or it's shut down entirely. It's yeah. uh, it's a lot easier said than done. But I think a, a conscious partner or, you know, two conscious partners can can find their way through that. But it, it requires a lot of work. It, it yeah. Requires, but. And if you think that all the way through the educational system, they hardly teach, you know, uh, kids about finances. Do they talk them? Do they help them with with communication? You know, and these are these are life skills, and often they they get overlooked, and bad habits come in, and the confrontation comes up, or the the the, the not sticking with something. You know, and you know, I read a couple of years ago that yeah, one good bit of news, divorces were down. But then if you look at, you know, what's driving them, you know, <laughs> the Freakonomics is, hey, marriages were down. It's yeah. just, a, you know, it's just a symptom. But the uh, I, I would say to to, uh, to anyone get counseling, work with a coach, okay? And in, in this this day and age, you know, wherever we went through all of the, you know, the last few years, people working at home, people that are single, you know, the, uh, the office or wherever was their social um support they, they thought they had friends there and they would share and so on like that and they were plucked out of that and they were in isolation and then the whole mind game start then i'm inadequate i can't do this i wonder what that person is saying about me i'm a threat i'm going to lose my job blah 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 um if anyone's going through these things you know this this whole thing of mental health is not what we're talking about yeah mental fitness is what we're talking about resilience adaptability change is a constant and if if the the pitch and pace of my my voice has gone up, I get very excited about this. You know, understanding how to solve problems with a clear head. Yeah. One more top. One more question on that topic before we branch off. Yeah. So, in your opinion, or in your experience, because I'm sure you have ample of both, what do you think is the role of a man and the role of a woman? for them to bring to a long-term relationship or marriage for it to be successful. Is it the same? Are there certain unique things that both sides need to bring? Um, communication, first and foremost. Um, and, and look, I, I come from a, even myself, my, my situation as I grew up, um, my parents were constantly working, but they were always working together in the business. So they saw each other all of the time. Um, I said to my wife from a, a, an early age, um, uh, as we started to have children, I said, look, I'm going to go off and start my business. You stay home with the children. I'll go out and I'll do the, you know, I'll, you know, um, earn the money for bread. And so on. my job is to keep the roof over the, the family's head and food in the fridge. Now, not every, um, family want to do that and it, and it, and it's harsh but when you have you know in this day and age to have a the lifestyle and the comforts that people want you know people don't hardly ever save up for it they'll just stick it on a credit card and uh, there's this you know uh, a, a young couple they're working well they're earning money they're getting all the trappings and then the baby comes along and then suddenly there's one income plus all that additional costs now these are these are pressures so, but I, I think that life planning for couples should be a, um, a, a, almost mandatory. And I think society as, as a whole would benefit from it. And it needs very, very clear communication. And it's almost like when you, 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 you have a project, okay? You have a sales plan. Somewhere along the way, there's going to be, a, you know, we're going to we're going to check the results and we're going to see whether we're on track or whether we need to make any modifications in behaviors or training or whatever. And it can be knowledge. But if 
if two people both are having a um, uh, a position that's intransigent, where egos are kicking in, and anger and fear and remorse and you know all of these these things are coming up instead of focusing on the, the whole reason that they got married because they loved each other, and you know there's this uh, there's this this spark of, of of attraction and it can be so attractive for so long you know if not controlled that can actually be the one thing that actually breaks things down you know i, I remember reading of a of a um, uh, um a couple where the the young lady was infatuated by the, the way the the man held himself at the restaurant and look you know we'll order this and we'll have that and so on and it became a a thing that every time they went out he he ordered for both of them I, I think you'll like this, try this, and and then took care of the bill. Eventually, they go off and get married. And found that those controlling habits became unattractive because they were manifesting in many other areas of life. And and that, you know, the female partner felt overshadowed, didn't have a voice. You know, simple things that that can be attractive can come back and and be the the most destructive thing. You know, later. And so I would say communication is the big thing. And um, one uh, old sage told me at one time, he said, look, even if you're shouting at each other, it's still communication. When that stops, it's all over. Do you think between a man and a woman that needs to be a clear leader of the unit and the household? Or do you subscribe to the concept of a 50-50, 100% equal arrangement? Um, I think that comes down to what the individual is comfortable with. Um, I, you know, in retrospect, I would say more of a 50-50, you know, each, you know, uh, shared chores. You know, um, my wife chases me out of the kitchen. She doesn't want me in there, you know, but <laughs> even though I want to be helping because I, I like cooking and I want to help her. I don't want to do it going through all of this stuff. And so we're very much a home cook thing. And, you know, um, it's, it, it 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 can create some arguments, so I've I've learned to to stay out. Okay, I'll give her what she wants. I'll stay out of the kitchen, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, you know, and and that's just a sort of a you know tongue in cheek sort of extreme thing there, wherever. But it comes to agreement, you know. Um, rather, you know, agreements rather than sort of expectations. Really on. Let's get the contract in place and and tape it on the fridge. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Clarity and, and, and communication, whatever that means for yeah. the two people. Cool. Yeah. So without going a little further into the relationships, just wanted to pick your brain a little bit there. Um, let's get to the last side of that triangle. And that's well, the body. When we've kind of touched upon it, of course, because it's related to the other two. But what's going on with people's bodies? What's the state of health there? Why is it good? Why is it bad? And really, what can we do about it? Well, you know, it's in a state, okay, <laughs> and it's <clears throat> and and it it comes back to external influences. You know, we mentioned about earlier of um, you know growing up in these times. You know, social media, TV, you know, TikTok, Twitter. Oops, yeah, I'm not gonna get in trouble for saying those names or whatever like that. But they were things we never had to contend with. You know, when I was growing up, and maybe you and your parents and the parents before them. And um, when we consider what is going on in the environment nowadays, uh, we've covered the relationship stuff. We've covered the, you know, um, you know the 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 stress and mental fitness and adaptability and resilience and things like that. And we think of the, the body that we have. If we go back to like the 15th century, pretty much we could, you know, we didn't have to worry about things apart from the plague and all of those things. But there weren't environmental toxins around. There weren't diesel fumes everywhere. We didn't have to worry about mercury, um, you know, um, leaching out into the water because, you know, coal-fired power plants of, of years gone by where the rain has dropped, uh, you know, uh, um, traces of mercury into the uh, into the drinking water, which has permeated down through the ground soil and got up into the crops, even the organic ones we've got. Now, these are extreme things, but the point I want to make is that, uh, you know, we can absorb most things. 
we can absorb mental pressures. We can absorb you know, pressures in relationships. We can absorb pressures in the things that come into our body. But in every one of these three sides of the triangle, there's a tipping point. And, you know, um, I, in each of the things that I, um, I, I, I subscribe to and I, I use in my, my coaching practice and life in general, um, I would say are phases of toxicity. And in the, um, the environmental toxicity part of it, you know, the, the body reacts in certain ways. And if you think that, um, I think it's the last time I read it, it was something like 80,000 industrial chemicals that are out there. And only five have ever been banned in the US. Now, whether it's a food colorant, whether it's something that's raining down from above from a power plant before, whether it's we have, you know, these these tragic stories of, of, of marine bases having blooming benzene in the in the drinking water and people you know, absorbing that stuff, you know, wars, you know, Agent Orange these fire pits or whatever like that and how they've had an, had an impact on, on people. So if we, if we accept that the, the body is, is basically a, a detoxification machine from, you know, and we start accumulating toxins as we're being born in the womb. And, you know, the, we're a, a dumping ground for what the, 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 the mother has in her body it all gets shared and whatever but we assume now that the um you know the baby's born um uh, and if you've got children or not of of nephews and nieces or were a child at once um there was there was the filling a diaper was easy okay <laughs> peeing on her a parent was easy we're a little elimination machine. Phase one, we'd call this. And this is where the body just eliminates stuff. You know, um, babies are born that way. You know, but um, when we're in that similar phase, um, of we're growing, we're starting to take stuff in. It's still good if we're um, getting rid of, you know, the toxins that we're picking up from food and water and the environment or wherever. We're sweating, we're pooping them out. You know, um, it even comes out through earwax and, and, and things like that. Um, all this is natural. You know, and your body should be running, you know, effectively. You pick up a little bit of a cold, you'll, you'll exert something, you know, um, your nose will run or whatever. It's your body just eliminating some of the bad stuff. Now, if, if, if that body starts to get a little bit more pressured by the environmental stuff, we start to, you know, move into the next phase. And this tends to be maybe up into the 20s because we've got, we've got a pretty resilient thing that, we, that we're, uh, we're given here in the body. Um, into the, the 20s, it could be the 30s, inflammation starts to creep in because of the diet. You know, lots of sugars, lots of starches, lots of, you know, refined stuff, you know, things in the water, you know, different chemicals, you know, we're smelling, we go to the gas station, wow, gas smells nice, you know, wherever it, you know, it's different, you know, and if you think of anyone that's ever gone through um, things like, you know, aches and pains, aunties and uncles that talk about these things, sometimes they get acute reactions, they just feel, you know, get very headachey and, you know, sometimes they can even be sick. Oh, it's, it's a bug that's going around or wherever. And then we then we start then you know to move into the next phases where your know, habits are not being changed. Maybe there's you know they live in an industrial area, they live in a city. There's lots of uh, you know um, a lot of fumes from from gas and whatever. And these <clears throat> these toxins start to basically you know build up in the body, and the body's absorbing them. Uh, often you know things like we we have in water, which are water soluble. Um, we take them in, they're in the water table, you know, like a, you know, this case with Camp Lejeune or wherever, those things can be assimilated into the body. And the places that they go, they go into the fat, they go into bones, they go into the brain. And, um, and if you think of, um, you know, um, as this would go on longer and longer and you know, a very common thing now for, uh, um, for, for people in the fifties and sixties is having brittle bones or an accumulation of fat around their stomach, you know, visceral things, or they're starting to get a, you know, 
maybe some mood swings, a couple of neurological issues and whatever. That's what we call the infection phase. You know, we so we started off at the elimination phase in the first one, then we moved into the inflammation phase, the phase two, and then we moved into the third phase, which is the infection phase. And then things start to get a little bit, a little bit more acute. The accumulation is building up. The body is saying, "Hey, I got to push these things." you know, out, away from vital organs, you know, still, you know, working in the body, working in all areas, but still outside the cells, the building blocks that we have. And it could, you know, start to do different things like create, you know, kidney stones, you know, where the body isn't quite eliminating stuff. Um, or it could be a cyst or something like that builds up, you know, all this inflammation and the bioaccumulation tends to to concentrate in in one place now there are there are three other phases that we move along but once you get past the the, the fourth phase things start to break down and if you imagine in the um, in the body there is a there's a cell okay there's in, and inside of the, every cell is a little nucleus now, if the, the outer shell of that cell starts to get attacked with oxidative stress through, you know, bad, you know, processed foods and having lots of sugars and, you know, outside influences or whatever, as soon as a little chink in the outer um, shell of that, uh, that cell occurs and these toxins are floating around in the body and the, the fat is full and the bones are full and whatever like that, it'll start to penetrate down through the cells. And once it gets on the inside of there into the nucleus, it can start to affect that. And it can affect the, you know, the, the, the building blocks of what going on in the cell and ultimately down into the DNA. And that's big problems. But as we're moving on every year, you know, uh, medicine and alternative medicine, you know, stuff outside of big pharma can, you know, shine light and hope on being able to reverse some of these things. So like as we, you know, we adopt habits and whether we're young, but later on in life, we recognize, hey, we know through communication, we know through working with somebody, there, there is a, a potential problem. We can reverse some of that. Equally, we can reverse some of this stuff that's going on inside of the body. And if we come back to that triangle, if if your body is, you're not feeling well, you know, you're just down and out, you, you aches and pains and whatever like that, you're not having a good experience. Is your relationship with other people going to be good? Are you going to be vibrant and jolly and happy? Or are you going to be the woe is me and, you know, thinking like the victim? And then, you know, then it starts to come into depression, anxiety, so we, we start to get this sort of vicious circle, this toxic triangle starting to roll. And uh, the good news in all of these things is that when, they, when, they, when they, uh, a light is sh shone upon them, they can be reversed. And the results can be magnificent. People get vitality back. They get happy back. They lose some of the aches and pains. So it's it it comes to a tipping point, and you've heard of you know things in uh, you know um, in this day they they talk of uh, metabolic syndrome. It's almost like playing bingo with different illnesses. Whether you're going to be overweight, whether you're going to have you know type two diabetes, whether you're going to have something else or whatever. Once you get a, you know two or three of these sort of of the big five. There's no going back. And that means medication, medication for the rest of your life. And those things are occurring with people younger and younger and younger in their lives. <clears throat> I'm a big proponent of a book. Um, it's by Dr. Gabo Mate. It's called When the Body Says No. And it's the, the connection between stress and, and bodily wellness. And he talks about um, um, things like ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease and how there's been a, a significant uptake or uptick in it um, over um, this, you know, recent generations. Um, these things are not sort of, in his opinion, they're not hereditary. They are, 
influenced by the environment and the stresses that uh, that people go through. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's an interesting read, and uh, I would uh, you know I always recommend that. Um, so you know, if we want vitality, it all it it's uh, it's the it's the holy trinity, you know the the body, our relationships with other people, and the relationship you know with ourselves, the love for ourselves. Yeah, all of these things are essential to consider in life because if one of them's off, it can very quickly trigger a downward spiral of all of them. And then the converse to that is. When you get one right, it makes it easier to get the others and then build upon each other. And you got to be circling back. It's like you have these three buckets of life in the three things, the mind, the body, and your relationships with others. And you have to constantly be attending to the balance of all of them. Otherwise, it's going to tip and, and it's all, all going to fall over. You have to constantly be filling this one, filling that one, filling that one at an even level and i like the concept that everything in life is rented which means you can't just say oh okay yeah i got my mental health down bam let me totally ignore it and then tend to that and let me totally ignore that tend to the you have to it all those buckets have a hole at the bottom always yep. and you have to constantly be attending to them in the appropriate levels and in uh, conjunction with each other but your philosophy in the, in the seven phases of toxicity, it very much aligns with what I subscribe to and what I think is quite evident and obvious as well, in that the way that we've been led to think about ailments, especially over the years and, and in, the, in time in, in older age, it's BS. It's nonsense. It's absolute lie and a scam. Everything has been contributed to falsely genetics, 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 when it is just all a result of toxicity. Mm. All of it, all of it, all of it. I don't care what ailment it is. You name it. Pick your favorite one or the one you're most passionate about. All of it is toxicity. I don't care whether it's cancer, AIDS, autism, Alzheimer's. All of them have certain things that have built up in certain parts of the body, whether it's the brain, the gut, or anywhere in between and all over, that are responsible for the symptoms and what happens. But people get caught in this spiral because their entire comprehension of the way the body and health works, they get caught in these, uh, being wrong, they get caught in this downward spiral of, oh, one of these things has presented, hmm, Let's not tend to what may have contributed to it. Let's take this intervention in the form of pill, surgery, all these other things that, again, cause more symptoms, don't really address the root. Now you have a further imbalance in the gut, a further imbalance of your hormones, a further imbalance of neurotransmitter, everything. And then more and more things compound and nothing ever gets uh, resolved. And that's why, like you said, there's all these correlations of people getting this ailment and this ailment and this ailment. And they all usually go together because they compound each other. And like you said, it is getting younger and younger and more and more prevalent because the environmental toxins aren't going away. They're only increasing. And the quality they, of food or food-like products isn't getting better. It's only getting worse for the average people who aren't able to either financially or because they don't know better, do better. There, it doesn't mean it has to be like this. It's certainly hard to maintain cleanliness in the body, maybe even impossible unless you find yourself on the very tip top of a mountain where no contaminated rainwater can even go down. You know, it's... It's certainly a difficult task to maintain a body free of toxins or as free as possible, but it takes work and it's necessary work. Nothing in life comes easy. Uh, mm. And what in life is worth attending to, if not your own health and well being? Because if you're not actively trying to maintain your body's systems, your beautiful systems that you've been blessed with that can detoxify, but can only do so much and need the right tools. If you're not tending to that, well, then all of everything else is going to fall apart. Yeah. Inevitably. 
And, the, and you're absolutely right. And in all areas and all of these things, there's influences that come from other. It's just the, you know, the circle of life, the triangle of life or whatever. And I will say that the most expensive thing that we can own any time in our lives is a closed mind. And think if somebody wants you to be polarized, have their opinion and nothing else, you know, challenge, they've got an agenda. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You always have to consider the source of information. And unfortunately, you cannot believe that there's a correlation between how official a channel of information is and how good or accurate or in your favor it is. Mm. To put it as, as politically correct, but as accurate as possible. You know, and they, you know, I'm I'm a I, I grew up in the world of fixing stuff and you know I've got solutions for all of this stuff. I'm not so let's here. talk about it. Let's go there, <laughs> right? Because we I, talked about a lot of problems, but what's that worth if we're not focused on solutions? Okay. What yeah. are the solutions? Which one do you want to talk about first? What can and we can you know involve that with what you do? So because you have mm -hmm. solutions that you pitch for all of them, right? So let's talk about I, what you do and what you pitch. Do. And in it, it's it's um it's it's a fine line between you know I, res I respect what you're doing here um you know I I love to work with people I love because I lo I love to see the impact that they can have using the knowledge that I've gained and and the resources this is one thing positive intelligence I learned about this and um, this is a book okay this is all about helping your your mind these you are the book or no, no, that's that's something, and uh, this is uh, something called clear drops. Okay, this is for getting stuff out of your body, uh, heavy metals, toxins, molds, mycotoxins, stuff like that. Stuff we accumulate. Now, if we dwell on, you know, bad stuff's going to be happening all the time. The one thing in uh, positive intelligence, which is is a culmination of different types of research. Uh, and psychology and so on like that. We'll go too much into that. Both of these things came along to me in the depths of it. The gift and opportunity which I've learned to appreciate and 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 help others with is to look at the situation and look for that gift, look for that opportunity without jumping to the the condemnation. It's all bad and the the judgment of it all and. Two things here that came along to me during one week, deep in COVID, when I was not working, you know, my business was, you know, <laughs> when you're in a people business, you can't meet with people, then it, it's, a, it's a challenge. And uh, and the whole Zoom stuff hadn't really kicked off, you know, as, as much as it has now. Um, I had time to think. I had time to gather my thoughts. And I had two conversations. One was about one, one was about the other. And they dovetailed Everything that I've been working on over the 10 years previously, they gave it a cement that tied it together. And it's all about knowledge. And it's all about the more uh, information we have, the less fearful we need to be. We can trust ourselves. And once we start, you know, getting scared of what's going on, this is again, and I'll come back to this word resilience. If we don't have that mental fortitude, that resilience, stress kicks in. Stress kicks in, does damage to the body, does damage to the relationships, and off it goes. We start overeating, eating processed foods. We start accumulating stuff that we need to clean these toxins out. Why? Because they're dragging us further down. And it goes on and on and on. So what what I what I what came you know, I, I grew up in a little village in, in Wales and it's almost like a yeah, I know. A subset of Missouri, show me state, <laughs> prove it to me. So I had time to 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 research these things. But what was for me, these subjects weren't strange. I'd learned about them previously, but they came back in a refined form with a different messenger. So I would urge anyone that, you know, coming back to the whole mind, you know, keep it open or whatever, it might not be the right messenger. There might be somebody listening here, you know, oh, I don't like what they're saying there. Don't don't look at the, the messenger, look at the content, think about it, go research it, go stimulate it. 
you know, um, you know, marinate it or whatever. If there is a problem, we all have innate sort of ways of uh, of solving problems. Once we get into the, you know, the habit of of knowing the right questions to ask. I used to work for a German company, and uh, I was, oh my goodness gracious, the the amount of products they had and whatever. And the big boss told me this one time. He said, "Look, you know, what do you think?" I said, oh, "I'm going back to my old company." I said, "He said, why?" I said, "There's too much to learn here." He said, ah, "Don't worry, you don't need to know it all. You just need to know where to find it." It's like going to the library. Know the questions to ask. Trust yourself on that. And you know, if you're not feeling well, hey, a pill or a or a reach in for a bottle. Yeah, that's not the way to do it. There are underlying, there's there's a toxicity in there somewhere. It's in that relationship. It's in that thought. It's in that, you know, substance that's going into the body. So yeah, uh, it's it's important not to get caught up on all the bad because there certainly is a lot of it. There certainly is a lot of things to be upset about. There's certainly a lot of things to, you know, that one could fall into a state of fear about whether it's, you know, what's going on in this, in the world here, there, everywhere, or even around me, you know, there might, might be a lot of bad stuff going on that uh, are harmful, mm -hmm. but stewing in that and marinating in that is going to kill you even faster than those <laughs> things themselves will kill you. Right. Yeah. And, and so I promote having a, a working level of conscious awareness of what's going on in the world so, but specifically about, about what's going on around you, I think media has allowed people to know too much of what's going on in areas that have zero effect on them. And, and of course, we could say all things have an effect on humanity, so all things trickle down. And if it happens in one place, it could happen here. So let's know. But ultimately, what makes the biggest difference to think about is what can I do right now? Yeah. To improve my scenario. Okay, this is what I'm looking at. These, this is the board of life as it sits in front of me. These are my circumstances. These are the pieces that I have to work with. How can I arrange them to create an optimal solution or, or an optimal experience moving forward? And that itself is a whole umbrella. What and so you touched on that one product for the physical side of things, and you could certainly go into that. Let's talk about the physical side. What is something actionable that someone could do now to start to try to get their body right? Well, I default to things. I never tell anybody that you know to to, to do anything I've not done. And what I learned about this is, and, and it took a lot. So I'm a I'm a I'm a deep thinker, and I you know tell me something, and I'll go off to like Alice in Wonderland, you know, following the White Rabbit, and I'll be down the hole, and I'll go off, and I will keep I'll have it on my mind, and it'll be weeks and weeks and weeks until I'm happy, or at least I've made a decision. Okay, and we try it and see. Um, and what I, I learned, I actually learned about um, this product or something similar to it, at least the substance. <clears throat> Take volcanic lava, cool it in the ocean, produces a certain type of salt. You break it down under a, a, a microscope, it looks like a sponge. It's got little holes in there. Um, nature gave it properties that it's negatively charged. Na nature gave um, radioactive materials properties that they're positively charged. Well, you put these two together and they bind and they stay bound. But what I learned was um, that result of the, you know, the, the cooling of the lava in the, in the salt water produced something called a zeolite. And that zeolite has been used for thousands of years for all sorts of different things. Going back as far as the Romans, in recent times, they've used it for nuclear cleanup. Why? Because it binds the bad stuff to it, and they can take it away and manage it. Well, certain cultures learn to put this and like a, you know, just stir it up in, in water and drink it. They knew it did something good in their bodies, and it did. <clears throat> also introduced other bad things because it's full of nasty elemental impurities if it's not cleaned. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, as what I learned about about eight years ago was a, a product that wasn't maybe as in as refined state as it could have been and um it was taking stuff out of the out of the gut maybe heavy metals maybe molds maybe whatever it was 
what I, I quizzed about this product, what's different? And they say, well, it's, it's in a solution. Now, can you imagine how hard it is to grind something up, especially a rock, and have it go into a solution? A suspension, yes. <laughs> Salt, yeah, that goes into a solution. Well, guess what? The basis of this is an aluminosilicate kind of salt. But in order to get it into the body, the, the man who put this together um, added vitamin C to it. That allowed it to get into the bloodstream through the duodenum and the walls of the uh, intestines and things like this. Um, and every cell in, in our bloodstream um, has got a vitamin C receptor on it. And it allowed to go in to the cell and then start acting like it does in a nuclear cleanup, bind into toxins. The molecular weight changes, it diffuses back out through the cell wall and gets urinated out. Now, this is gentle. You don't know what's going on, just in the same way as the accumulation was going on. Now, if it took you 60 years to get where you are and you go like in phase five and your body is starting to break down, you know, and, you know, it needs an intervention. You're sluggish. ATP is not being being made. You know, antioxidants are needed to be pounded into the body to just to help it, you know, keep functioning or whatever. Taking something like this can help reverse some of that. Now, this is only, you know, um, if you imagine it's ancient wisdom that's been, give, been given a new look at. And, you know, I, I still marvel at some of the stuff that my, my mother would tell me about growing up on the farm. Do this, do that. You know, it, it, it comes back with someone on, you know, Good Morning America or something. Hey, guess what we've got? So my mother was telling me about that 50 years ago. We thought she was crazy. Yeah, yeah that's why the whole name of the show is Ancient Wisdom, Modern Health, because yeah. the real truth to health that's been hidden or forgotten or whatever you want to call it is ancient they knew this before there's nothing new under the sun our bodies our biology is still the same the world around us may have changed a little bit and society's changed a lot of bit but the stuff that worked long ago is the same stuff that works now and that's why yeah, a lot of you know scientists or researchers or people with products to sell come out and say oh we've got this brand new brand new thing brand new discovery People knew about it, you know, just because a study says it now doesn't mean it was not existent all, all this time and known about. But yeah, you know, sometimes stuff is very simple, as as simple as some volcanic rock. Yeah, very good for you, you know, we, we don't need all these crazy <laughs> synthetic uh, synthesized, you know, so-called solutions. Sometimes you just need some good old volcano rock, right? <laughs> yeah, some good old volcano rock. But don't get me wrong, I I I, I love the doctors. If if um if I got my hand caught in a lawnmower, I'm the first place I'm going is a doctor in a hospital. You know, yeah. but the, you know, and you're right. There's nothing new under the sun. But sometimes in in the way people are taught things, for 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 certain reasons, certain stuff isn't taught. Okay, so if we you know, we're in an age of, in, of enlightenment now. We're, we're moving into the, as I, I would call it, the, the next industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. It's all about information, all about data. And, you know, um, you know um, it, it's exciting times to be in if we embrace it. And this is why look at what people are showing you in front of you and, and, and question it, evaluate it, then make a decision and try it. If it's not for you, hey, it's not for you. So yeah, um, I think... <laughs> I think we're coming out of uh, coming out of the informational dark ages. Mm. You know, people think the dark ages or, or some medieval times were so long ago, not being able to look around and see what's been going on in the world around us and how people have been led down this complete outsourcing of all information and all knowledge and all healing and all anything and just been kind of going through the motions of whatever they were allowed to do uh, in spite of so much other greatness that's been being purposefully or maybe accidentally hidden yeah. we know it's on purpose um and, you know and the one side i mean i i don't want to i don't want this to decay into a you know a marketing or a product pitch but what i'll say i'll I'll give you information if, if i've if i've said anything and it's resonated with anyone don't don't sit in just misery and whatever something's not right there's a reason something's not right 
And so often, as you've said, it can be very simplistic. It can be ancient wisdom. And um, um, I'll one thing that I always always use about you know the power of the mind or whatever is a, a Chinese proverb, and it says that if you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. If you're at peace, you're living in the present. Yeah. Now, just just imagine how comfortable you can be when you when you're living in that present because you know how to react when things are happening around you because you're armed with that knowledge you know where to go next hey i'm you know I'll, i need to go and watch one of zach's podcasts he, he played this he had somebody on that spoke about this let me just go check it out not to just discount things and and if one thing is in supply in this day and age is trust people don't trust themselves they don't trust those around them. They don't trust the ones that work them. They don't trust the media. They don't trust this. They just trust ourselves. Go with your gut. The inexorable connection between what goes on in your gut and what goes on in your mind, hey, go off and read up about that. There's more and more coming out than saying that these two are tightly connected. They're not separate sort of, you know, you know, inter or unconnected systems. We are one big system, which is compartmentalized into smaller systems, much like a car. You've got a braking system and ignore exhaust system. You've got a, I mean, fuel system or whatever. Without all of them, the car doesn't work. Certainly. And uh, we're going to stick to the solutions based things now. And I'm going to ask you about mental health solutions in a second, but before we get too far off the clear drops and the zeolite powder, um, is there, does it detox everything, any sort of toxin out of the body? Is there, is it only certain types of toxins? Are there certain things that it misses that you'd want to address otherwise? Or is it kind of like a one-stop shop? Okay. It's pretty, I would, I would say as close to a one-stop shop as you can get. If you think that um, everything on the periodic table, okay, that could exist in, in the environment that um, we could potentially do you know, we can tolerate so much, but so much it'll be an overload or whatever, like maybe aluminum or whatever like that. Hey, you know, the the most abundant element on Earth has no function in any environmental activity. No, no plant needs aluminum. No animal is deficient of aluminum. <laughs> Strange. And we absorb this stuff, and that's one example of, you know, you have to go off and read about some of the things that that'll do. So to answer your question, no. Um, heavy metal um, toxicity and environmental toxicity, um, is it, it's, it's, it, we, we're getting past that point that we can absorb it um, safely and manage it. And it is very interesting as much as, um, you know, there was a study uh, comes out every few years. I think it's called a Framington study. And um, last year it was talking about weight loss. And if you imagine um, we absorb or accumulate uh, toxins, heavy metals in, in fat tissues, in bone and in brain tissue. Now, <clears throat> if we start building up, you know, visceral fat around our stomach, around our organs or wherever, as these um, um, uh, these environmental toxins come in, you know, many are organic. They come out through the water. They come through the food and through our lungs or wherever like that. Get into the bloodstream, find their way to the fat tissues and others. Um, we store them. They're quite happy. You know, they're doing their whole thing. We come along and detox them, um, or we lose a lot of weight. They get released. Now, that could be viruses, that could be the heavy metals and toxins, all this stuff is accumulated. It's looking for a new home. It doesn't want to get out of the body. It's quite happy. It's assimilated. It's going to go find different places to be. And the places it's going to go, you know, if it can get back into the fat tissue, it will. Otherwise, it's going to look for the bones in the brain or wherever. Yeah. And so uh, while someone's experiencing that breakdown or, or release of toxins, is there potential for Herzheimer reactions or detoxification reactions while taking the zeolite? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, people would say, you know, the, we've never had a contraindication in eight years of, of this product being around um, with any you know pharmaceuticals. And there's no cases of that. It's a very stable product. It's very gentle and so on. Um, only thing people would say is, oh, I, I was taking this and after a week or so, yeah, I, I got a big cold. You know, I didn't feel so good. What's happening then is, is the 
what's pent up is being released and getting back into the system and the, and the, the body then is reacting according to it. It's the immune system is, hey, there's a, there's a, there's a flu virus coming at me here. I, I better react. You know, I better have a runny nose and a headache. Mm -hmm. And it, it takes time to get this accumulation out. And, but it can come out. And the thing with the, you know, um, people in, in, in midlife, maybe will say, want to get their beach weight back or whatever, you know, or a, my wedding dress doesn't fit or something like that. They lose a bit of weight. The same kind of thing happens there. Those toxins have got to go somewhere because they haven't got a home to be in. So, you know, if you're going on weight loss, if you're going to have dentistry work done, you know, swapping out um, amalgam fillings, you know, people worried about the mercury in them, get on this stuff in advance, get the body ready for it. And it's, it's start, you know, you know, it's in the system. And as these things get released, it'll, it'll catch them and bind them and take them out. Um, we'll be putting a big push onto this now in the, in the coming months of uh, um, we had some, you know, a, a small bump in our distribution uh, um, supply chain and so on, all fixed, you know, products made in America, highest standards, FDA inspected, validated, all of this stuff covered by patents. This right. is a, a very, very sound, very respected product and from where it's come from. And um yeah, so to answer your question, no, it can it can pretty much handle anything you can throw at it. That's and, awesome. So, and you touched upon there that it's good not just retroactively if you have a certain thing that you want to detox from or you want to do a specific detoxification protocol, but could also be used to upkeep our detoxification pathways and kind of keep things coming out as soon as they're coming in, just yeah. like that. And, and so, if you want to touch briefly upon why. Why clear drops? Why would someone go with clear drops versus some of the alternatives out there or whatever in, in the zeolite world? Okay. And and I tread carefully using the word science. Science is a bad rap lately. <laughs> um, okay. Um, it's the only um, triple patented, and I mean issued patents, uh, nutritional subject uh, product of this this type. It's a nutritional products not a drug okay it's not we have a you know a, um, a physician version which only a, you, know, you have to have a medical license to get hold of it but this is the consumer strength when i'm talking about okay so it's triple patented it's made in an fda laboratory um or fda inspected laboratory um it has a long track record of stability and working um and it's safe gentle uh it's the only um, nutritional supplement ever to go through something called a pharmacokinetic study. And that is a study which every drug in the pharmacy needs to go through to prove that it does what it says it's going to do. Okay, so it's got that going for it. Uh, tested for 69 elemental impurities, whereas uh, drugs in the pharmacy are only tested for 24. Um, so. When the final product is made, it's tested again for 29 elemental impurities. Now, as a nutritional supplement, you know, why is that different? Well, something that you would buy, you know, a shake or a, you know, a product from somewhere else or wherever is only tested by law for four elemental impurities, lead, mercury, arsenic, and cadmium. So it's a safe product. Um, it works. It's the closest um, thing that you will find to something called chelation outside of a hospital. And um, we're taking this to the world. Why? Because the world needs it. Um, but plenty of, <clears throat> of of sort of experience behind it that, it, that it's worked. Okay, <clears throat> we can we have papers and studies that um, we'll be sharing a bit more. You know. Uh, we're all about science. We never make claims. Um, it's it's almost like the Wild West. It's almost like the CBD world was a few years ago. Zeolites, people are, are latching onto them now. But be careful. Um, our um, recent inspection from the FDA took nine days with zero errors. Any product that anyone makes a claim about that's going deep into the body, it'll cross the blood-brain barrier. Don't believe these things. Say, 
I want to see the patents. I want to see the FDA testing. Um, and, you know, um, I, I, if people want to get in touch with me, I can share this. I can you know, give you information you can place out there. Um, it's all out on our website, you know, the, the FAQs, um, backed by patents, backed by studies, backed by, you know, um, um, validations, backed by anything you can imagine. You know, it, it, I wouldn't put my name and reputation behind anything until I was positive that uh, it was worthy of it. And um, <clears throat> this will this will be my future. That's awesome. And so there's a great solution for the physical side of things. What about the mind and relationships? That's where your coaching solutions come into play, right? So yeah, yeah. what are the kind of things that you're doing to help people improve their mind and relationships? What are your solutions? Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier, let me uh, let me come off the um, take the uh, the chat off and I'm probably, you know, I'm a, I'm a really good bookseller for people. OK, um, positive intelligence. OK, why only 20 percent of teams and individuals achieve their, their true potential? Well, um, what this is about really is is coming back to the what I've mentioned earlier about. What Aristotle said, you know, um, give me the child for seven years. Um, I will show you the man. And um, the gentleman behind this um, is a uh, was a, a Stanford professor and researcher. And um, he had his own troubles in his life growing up. And this is what the book is ostensibly about. Um, but he took a, a, a point in time where he went into research and he, he, he looked at what was going on in, in the field of neuroscience, cognitive behavioral psychology, performance science and, uh, and positive psychology and then added in his own positive intelligence studies in here. And I'm talking, you know, a half a million people going through his sort of uh, assessments and wherever and collating a lot of information and then um, doing things called factor analysis which were big mathematical problem solving things to look for for cause and effect between you know people answer this in a certain way how many people you know hundreds of thousands of them also answer that way and what he came out with was um, uh, we've all heard a character traits. Okay, these are these are behavioral things that we have, whether it's emotional or whatever. And I mentioned earlier, it's all about the storyteller. I'd read some books on psychology in the past, didn't resonate with me. Well, I learned about this and how um, easy it was to adopt. And if you imagine it's a thing like an operating system. And the operating system says, let, let me use an analogy, Star Wars, we've got Darth Vader, and he's got all these guys in white, which are the stormtroopers. They are over on the one side of the uh, the fence. We've got Yoda, little Jedi, comes along, and he's on his own. At the end of every film, you see Yoda <laughs> surrounded by Darth Vader and hundreds of these, these guys in white. And little Yoda, he looks, and you can see a little bit of panic on his face. Takes a breath, gets composure, turns his lightsaber on, takes care of them all. And this is this is the you know the the storyline under um, positive intelligence. If you imagine Darth Vader, he's this nasty voice that we've we've learned to uh, uh, listen to as we've grown up. What's been going on in our formative years? This is the way we think. This is the way we start to react. And we've, we, we've got between six and 16,000 thoughts going on. We judge situations, we judge people, and we judge ourselves you know, according to those thoughts. So Darth Vader pops up, says, Malcolm, you stupid. You've done that, and you shouldn't have done it. You, you knew better or whatever. Hold on a moment. I'm going to go get a buddy of mine. And he goes along and he brings on one of the stormtroopers. And there are nine of them. They're called the saboteurs. And each of those, the saboteurs specializes in something that can add to my anxiety, add to my sense of victimhood, add to my sense of 
hyper achievement. I've done this. Hey, I, no, I don't need to rejoice and you know I've achieved my goal. I got to push on because people are watching me. My ego kicks in or whatever. So he's got that you know, uh, nine characters there that are all sort of reinforcing his message. And then over on the um, you know poor old Obi Wan Kenobi or, or Yoda, you know, all on their own. And what have they got? Well, they've got five superpowers as well as a lightsaber, I suppose they're packed in there. Empathy, exploration, innovation, the power of navigation, and the power of activation. And all of these kick in, and it's a process that we think of. And coming back to that pressure in my chest, I get a thought. The longer I dwell in that negativity, the longer the, the stress remains in my, my chest. It's almost like putting my hand on a hot plate. For a second, it's a warning. For two, three seconds, it's doing damage to my tissues, burning my fingers. The same analogy there is. So we teach a, um, a positive, intelligent process of when you recognize that things are going on, the judge, the saboteur comes in, you react, you recognize it, and you basically short circuit the impact that those saboteurs are having on you by um, analyzing the situation you're in. And the more you do it, the quicker you go through, all right, do I need to give myself some empathy here? You know, or is it the person in front of me? I wonder what kind of day they've had. I wonder how they grew up. I wonder they always like this. You know, I wonder they on pressure. They got worries and somebody just passed away. Who knows? But it's, it's searching for... We've all got an essence inside of us, which life has just had an influence on us. Everybody reacts in a bit of a different way. So as long as we can, you know, sort of question some of these things and accept a little bit in a bit more of a loving way, that's a good place to start. And then we can begin the exploration. I wonder what's, you know, wonder what's behind them there. You know, thought may come out of it. We don't need to use all five superpowers. It's wherever, you know, situationally, uh, uh, astute but at the end of it it's it ends up with that action that turning the, the lightsaber on and getting to work and yeah. when i listened to this i thought it was foo-foo <laughs> i absolutely thought it was californian nonsense <laughs> and it it went from woo-woo to woo-hoo i can say yeah. i think more and more people are realizing that what's been kind of mocked as woo woo or silliness or whatever word you want to put on it that they've used to talk about, you know, emotional or, or metaphysical things. More and more people are, are realizing that there is some credence to a lot of it, but I, I were you finishing that sentence there? Yeah. It, but it's how the message is delivered and we all learn in different ways. We read, we, we, we listen to people. We learn by example, you know, um, we've got apps. It's, it's gamification comes into it. It's accountability. It's audible stuff. It's reading. It's experiential things, you know, somatic. We, we all learn in different ways. And, you know, I, whether it's people like, um, I can say what's the guy's name now. Ah, one thing. I've got his book sat there. Went to see him in, in Atlanta. It was hearing a lot of the same things, but the message just resonated when it came from Shazad Shamin. So much as I, you know, I went through the program, I've taken other people through it, you know, dozens and dozens now. I went off, I got certified, became a coach, and it's just beginning for me. I'm no black belt. The originator is no black belt. It's a work in progress, much like that detox. So when you draw the analogies, I'm detoxing my mental processes. I'm taking the bad out and bringing the good in. And this is manifested in relationships because I know how to react to people in front of me. That's so. amazing. So And so through your work with people, you get to the root of which of the common unhealthy habits or behaviors or inner thought patterns might be present in them. You get to the bottom of where that might be coming from. And, and then how can we correct those unhealthy habits? And so how exactly does that process work? Are you working 
one-on-one -on -one as a coach with someone? Are you working with whole teams like in a business? Do they, do you give out your information in person? Can you work virtually? Is it that you said you have an app? So can people just work at their own pace in the app? What is the process of working with Malcolm look like? All of the above. Um, experience shows that um, we retain things more when working in a in a pod, you know, a maximum of five, six people. Um, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff, you know, executives, for example, you know, team leaders sometimes are, a, you know, a hesitant to demonstrate the vulnerability to a team, you know, yeah. and the the corporate world has changed. The landscape has changed, and management styles haven't changed. It's very much more collaboration. Vulnerability is a power for any manager, any leader to exhibit. If you imagine somebody that's built a business on their own or wherever that uh, has done everything themselves and then they're sitting in their office wondering what to do next and wondering why they got to where they are, they have an imposter syndrome. They don't communicate well. They expect different things off different people. So all that being said, in working with Malcolm is we get to the root using specific tools like the saboteur assessment of where these character traits, where these saboteurs are rising to the top. And going back to the, the formative years, what the experience was like in school, those saboteurs are the protectors. They are some of our strongest and, and best characteristics, but they're being overused. They don't know when to turn off. So sometimes there's a case to say, hey, shut up, you had your time, okay? There is a different way because I've learned, you know, how to handle myself and react, you know, uh, and anticipate in the behavior of those saboteurs. It's an absolute power. It's like taking your, taking your, your, your mind to the gym as opposed to taking your biceps and your, and your quads. And yeah. Your and that's huge because you nailed, nailed an important point because unhealthy thought patterns, sometimes they come from necessity. Sometimes they come, as, you know, as coping mechanisms from an extreme or unfortunate scenario that someone faced themselves or, or found themselves facing, and they had to develop that thought pattern or process for their brain not to self-destruct or self-implode, especially as a young child. But when the aggressor or the aggressor situation is gone, we need to know how to recognize that thought pattern that developed and say, hey, that no longer serves me and is actually only going to harm me. So that's a that's a really good way to go about it. And I'm, I'm remember, so I'll, I'll just, excuse me, cutting you off here. Yeah, remember yeah. I said, if you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future, the fear of the unknown. Yeah. If you're at peace, you're living in the present. How often have you had something on your mind when you've been asleep and you, it's gone over and over in your mind, disturbing your sleep or whatever, and you, and, and you wake up and it's still there. And then you get busy with something. You don't worry about it. You're in the zone. Yeah. So what we want to do is bring people back into that zone. And we call it the, it's the, it's the sage way of ease and flow. Um, I, I, I open an invitation to you. Give me 40 minutes. Go through this. It'll shine a light in a couple of areas. You know, it'll go from the woo, woo to the woo hoo. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah, this is important stuff you're talking about. And you work with people, whether they're looking to improve their personal life scenario or their professional scenario or a combination of the above. Is that correct? All of the above. But if we if we if we view things in that 360 approach, you know, um, I've, I've got some clients that have been with me, you know, and it goes on into the you know like a couple of years now. Um, and coming back to that book I mentioned of, um, with, with Matt or Gabe, uh, Gabo Mate, um, it, it was a case in there. He was talking about a, a, a person that had been, imagine somebody has been very stressed. Somebody is a, a caregiver. Okay. Um, you know, um, caring for a significant other all the way through to a, you know, the, the death or whatever, and having no outlet themselves to share it. They internalize everything. Well, this constant 
high level of things like cortisol and uh, adrenaline or whatever does damage to the body. They, you know, it's it's there, fight or flight. It's a fuel to get you away. But you know, if it's persistent, it'll start to you know pushed out to the extremes and it'll manifest in the joints, aches and pains, and things like this. Well, after reading that, I I, I met a person, and I went. We had a, we were introduced by you know a third, you know, a common person between us. Um, I'm just talking, and it was all about. This person was um, had been taking these drops, and we got talking or whatever. And this, um, she said, "Well, you know, I I nursed my you know, husband through terminal cancer. I, I nursed my father through dementia." My mother's in a care home, assisted living. Uh, and I said, you, do you have children? She said, no. I said, do you have a circle of friends? No, I've been busy with it. So, you know, tell me what's going on in your life. She said, oh, I, you know, I, I suffer with arthritis. Okay. So we made a couple little changes and it, it, you know, she agreed, you know, she, yeah, I'll, I'll go through the assessment with you. And we, we could see where a lot of what she was going through, she'd been internalizing. She was an absolute caregiver, and it really reminded me of this book. And, you know, by the grace of God, she stuck with me over this last, you know, year, 18 months, making no claims of cures or anything. But when somebody says, the recommendations you've given me, I've, I've, I've changed my dietary habits a little bit. I'm still taking these drops. I'm, I'm doing the app every day. I'm doing the mental, you know, fitness exercises. Guess what? I haven't been to the pain clinic for a month for an injection. Something is working. No. It, you go cold when you hear that because others um, are benefiting from what you are, the, 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 the footprint that you're leaving in the world. And I've I've got multiples of others that have, have gone through this program with me and stayed. And what they want to know is, hey, can you tell me about the other side of the triangle? I don't push it. I don't worry about it. They, they, they're inquisitive. Tell me about the other side of the triangle. I'm struggling in my relationships. I don't feel as vibrant as I used to. It's powerful stuff. Very powerful. And, and so if someone wants to experience something like that uh, person experienced and they want to get in contact with you. They want to check out the clear drops. They want to check out the uh, programs. Where can people go? Well, what are the, what are the websites people can go to? Should they go directly to the app? What's the name of the app? Where okay. can people find Malcolm that they want to work with you? I think what I'll do is I'll, um, I think I send a, a couple of bits of information, but I'll, I'll send you some um, uh, discreet uh, web links and uh, my information where they can check me out. And I say I've got nothing up my sleeves apart from my arms. Um, um, you'll find me on the web as mycoachmalcolm.com. Uh, Malcolm is spelt M-A-L-C-O-L-M. And uh, I, I tell people, you know, start with uh, um, a very simple uh you know, assessment, just talk for a few minutes. You know, we'll, we'll soon see whether we're on the right frequency. I'll get to understand a little bit more and, you know, we'll, we'll just work our way through it. There's, and again, come back to, hey, we're all, we're all made up of the same stuff. We've just been influenced in different ways at different times in our lives. And, uh, you know, um, again, we, we, and it, you know, I, I cut my hand a, a week or so ago, okay? I go, oh, I mean, I put my hand on the, you know, metaphorical hot stove. Stupid Malcolm, okay? I noticed yesterday, oh, it's gone. It's cleared up. That's my body self-repairing, regenerating. There's nothing that we can't do if you put our mind to it. And there's a lot of things that we can do if we just be the enabler. I didn't, I couldn't will that cut to repair itself, but I gave my body the right building blocks it needed to, to continue doing the job on my behalf. That's powerful. That is powerful stuff. That is very powerful. And normally I ask my guests if there's any one particular message that they'd like to leave off with. That was beautiful itself. So if you'd like to make that the last thing you say, by all means, but I will also ask you, is there a final message that you'd like to leave our listeners and viewers off with? It's difficult. You're doing it wrong. 
If you're not getting the results you want, something is missing. Talk to somebody, talk to a coach, talk to um, a medical practitioner, talk to a lot of people and go the direction you are comfortable with. And coming back to that final thing is the most expensive thing you can own at any time in your life is a closed mind. The age of enlightenment is upon us. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's uh, certainly something I agree with. There is a lot of avenues to take advantage of to better oneself, whether it is your mind, your body, your relationships, or any combination of the above. And I certainly think that Malcolm's avenues that he's mentioned today, whether it is working with him one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's the physical detoxifiers he's mentioned, they all sound worth exploring to myself. So I really hope the viewers take what he said tonight to heart. And I really hope everyone uses this information to better themselves. Yeah. I'll, Malcolm. I'll send you a, a QR code and wherever. And I, I put a, a little book out there, wrote a little book on mindfulness. I want to encourage everyone to you know, have, a, have a space and have a time in your day, you know, think and you know, take a breath, slow down. And uh, this has been a pleasure, Zach. Um, you know, um, I would love to reciprocate and have you come on to uh, my humble podcast, you know, the Toxic Triangle, and uh, and you know, share your message out there as well. And I'll uh, I'll give you some contact information. And uh, yeah, this is we're in exciting times. It's like, I, it's like I'm like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, a lot of good stuff going on. You know, there's a lot of good people connecting like yourself and myself. Definitely any listener, viewer, check out his podcast as well. It was called the, what was it called? Uh, the Toxic Triangle. That's the name of the podcast? Yeah, you can also get to it at the, at the Podcasting Pig. The Podcasting Pig or the yeah. Toxic Triangle, both names it goes by. It, yeah. Malcolm, I would love to collaborate further. For now, our episode is done. Thank you very much for coming on the show, my friend. Likewise. Okay. Enjoyed it. And just like that, episode 11 comes to a close. You are listening to The Health King's Court, Ancient Wisdom, Modern Health. Stay tuned. Be sure you are subscribed to the channel because there are many episodes coming your way as quickly as I can edit and publish them. A big thank you goes out to Malcolm for participating in the show. It was an absolute pleasure to chat with him. He's a very intelligent man with a lot of very interesting and good things to say. So please comment below what you thought of the episode. Did you enjoy it? Did you hate it? What did you think? Whatever it was, let us know in the comments. As always, tell your friends, ZachTheHealthKing.com.